Chapter 7 of Short Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short Short Stories by Theodore Dostoevsky Chapter 7 Another Man's Wife or The Husband Under the Bed An Extraordinary Adventure one be so kind sir allow me to ask you the gentleman so addressed started and looked with some alarm at the gentleman in raccoon furs who had accosted him so abruptly at eight o'clock in the evening in the street we all know that if a petersburg gentleman suddenly in the street speaks to another gentleman with whom he is unacquainted the second gentleman is invariably alarmed and so the gentleman addressed started and was somewhat alarmed excuse me for troubling you said the gentleman in raccoon but i i really don't know you will pardon me no doubt you see i am a little upset only then the young man in the wadded overcoat observed that this gentleman in the raccoon fur certainly was upset his wrinkled face was rather pale his voice trembling he was evidently in some confusion of mind his words did not follow easily from his tongue and it could be seen that it cost him a terrible effort to present a very humble request to a personage possibly his inferior in rank or condition in spite of the urgent necessity of addressing his request to somebody and indeed the request was in any case unseemly undignified strange coming from a man who had such a dignified fur coat such a respectable jacket of a superb dark green colour and such distinguished decorations adorning that jacket it was evident that the gentleman in raccoon was himself confused by all this so that at last he could not stand it but made up his mind to suppress his emotion and politely to put an end to the unpleasant position he had himself brought about excuse me i'm i'm not myself but it is true you don't know me forgive me for disturbing you i have changed my mind here from politeness he raised his hat and hurried off but allow me the little gentleman had however vanished into the darkness leaving the gentleman in the wadded overcoat in a state of stupefaction what a queer fellow thought the gentleman in the wadded coat after wondering as it was only natural and recovering at last from his stupefaction he bethought him of his own affairs and began walking to and fro staring intently at the gates of a house with an endless number of stories a fog was beginning to come on and the young man was somewhat relieved at it for his walking up and down was less noticeable than the fog though indeed no one would have noticed him but some cabmen who had been waiting all day without a fare excuse me the young man started again again the gentleman in raccoon was standing before him excuse me again he began but you you are no doubt an honourable man take no notice of my social position but i am getting muddled look at it as man to man you see before you sir a man craving a humble favour if i can what do you want <laughs> oh, you imagine perhaps that i am asking for money said the mysterious gentleman with a wry smile laughing hysterically and turning pale oh dear no no i see that i am tiresome to you excuse me i cannot bear myself consider that you are seeing a man in an agitated condition almost of insanity and do not draw any conclusion but to the point to the point responded the young man nodding his head encouragingly and impatiently now think of that a young man like you reminding me to keep to the point as though i were some heedless boy i must certainly be doting how do i seem to you in my degrading position tell me frankly 
The young man was overcome with confusion and said nothing. Allow me to ask you openly, have you not seen a lady? That is all I have to ask you, the gentleman in the raccoon coat said resolutely at last. Lady? Yes, a lady? Yes, I have seen, but I must say lots of them have passed. Just so, answered the mysterious gentleman with a bitter smile. I am muddled. I did not mean to ask that. Excuse me, I meant to say, haven't you seen a lady in a fox fur cape, in a dark velvet hood, in a black veil? No, I haven't noticed one like that. No, I think I haven't seen one. Well, in that case, ex excuse me. The young man wanted to ask a question, but the gentleman in raccoon vanished again again he left his patient listener in a state of stupefaction well the devil take him thought the young man in the wadded overcoat evidently troubled with annoyance he turned up his beaver collar and began cautiously walking to and fro again before the gates of the house of many stories he was raging inwardly why doesn't she come out he thought it will soon be eight o'clock the town clock struck eight. Oh, devil take you. Excuse me. Excuse me for speaking like that, but you came upon me so suddenly that you quite frightened me, said the young man, frowning and apologizing. Here I am again. I must strike you as tiresome and queer. Be so good as to explain at once, without more ado. I don't know what it is you are. You are in a hurry. Do you see? I will tell you everything openly, without wasting words. It cannot be helped. Circumstances sometimes bring together people of very different characters. But I see you are impatient, young man. So here, though I really don't know how to tell you. I am looking for a lady. I had made up my mind to tell you all about it. You see, I must know where that lady has gone, who she is. I imagine there is no need for you to know her name, young man. Well, well, what next? What next? But what a tone you take with me. Excuse me, but perhaps I have offended you by calling you young man. But I had nothing in short if you are willing to do me a very great service here it is a lady that is i mean a gentlewoman of a very good family of my acquaintance i have been commissioned i have no family you see oh put yourself in my position young man ah i've done it again excuse me i keep calling you young man every minute is precious only fancy that lady but cannot you tell me who lives in this house but lots of people live here ah <laughs> yes that is you are perfectly right answered the man in raccoon giving a slight laugh for the sake of good manners i feel i am rather muddled but why do you take that tone you see i admit frankly that i am muddled and however haughty you are you have seen enough of my humiliation to satisfy you <gasps> say a lady of honourable conduct that is of light tendencies excuse me i am so confused it is as though i were speaking of literature paul de Kock is supposed to be of light tendencies and all the trouble comes from him you see the young man looked compassionately at the gentleman in raccoon who seemed in a hopeless muddle and pausing stared at him with a meaningless smile and with a trembling hand for no apparent reason gripped the lappet of his wadded overcoat you ask who lives here said the young man stepping back a little yes you told me lots of people live here here i know that sofia ostafayevna lives here too 
the young man brought out in a low and even commiserating tone there you see you see you know something young man i assure you i don't i know nothing i judge from your troubled air i have just learned from the cook that she does come here but you are on the wrong tack that is with sofya ostafievna she does not know her no oh i beg your pardon then i see this is of no interest to you young man said the queer man with bitter irony listen said the young man hesitating i really don't understand why you are in such a state but tell me frankly i suppose you are being deceived the young man smiled approvingly we shall understand one another anyway he added and his whole person loftily betrayed an inclination to make a half bow you crush me but i frankly confess that is just it but it happens to every one i am deeply touched by your sympathy to be sure among young men though i am not young but you know habit a bachelor life among bachelors we all know oh yes we all know we all know but in what way can i be of assistance to you why look here admitting a visit to sofia ostafievna though i don't know for a fact where the lady has gone i only know that she is in that house but seeing you walking up and down and i am walking up and down on the same side myself i thought you see i am waiting for that lady i know that she is there i should like to meet her and explain to her how shocking and improper it is in fact you you understand me hmm well i am not acting for myself don't imagine it it is another man's wife her husband is standing over there on vosnesensky bridge he wants to catch her but he doesn't dare he is still loath to believe it as every husband is here the gentleman in raccoon made an effort to smile i am a friend of his you can see for yourself i am a person held in some esteem i could not be what you take me for oh uh, of course well well so you see i am on the lookout for her the task has been entrusted to me the unhappy husband but i know that the young lady is sly paul de cock for ever under her pillow i am certain she scurries off somewhere on the sly i must confess the cook told me she comes here i rushed off like a madman as soon as i heard the news i want to catch her i have long had suspicions and so i wanted to ask you you are walking here you you i don't know come what is it you want yes i have not the honour of your acquaintance i do not venture to inquire who and what you may be allow me to introduce myself anyway glad to meet you the gentleman quivering with agitation warmly shook the young man's hand i ought to have done this to begin with he added but i have lost all sense of good manners the gentleman in raccoon could not stand still as he talked he kept looking about him uneasily fidgeted with his feet and like a drowning man clutched at the young man's hand you see he went on i meant to address you in a friendly way excuse the freedom i meant to ask you to walk along the other side and down the side street where there is a back entrance i too on my side will walk from the front entrance so that we cannot miss her i'm afraid of missing her by myself i don't want to miss her when you see her stop her and shout to me but i'm mad only now i see the foolishness and impropriety of my suggestion no why no it, it's all right don't make excuses for me i am so upset i have never been in such a state before as though i were being tried for my life 
I must own, indeed, I will be straightforward and honourable with you, young man. I actually thought you might be the lover. That is, to put it simply, you want to know what I am doing here. You are an honourable man, my dear sir. I am far from supposing that you are he. I will not insult you with such a suspicion, but give me your word of honour that you are not the lover. Oh, very well, I'll give you my word of honour that I am a lover, but not of your wife. Otherwise, I shouldn't be here in the street, but should be with her now. Wife? Who told you she was my wife, young man? I am a bachelor. That, I, that is, I am a lover myself. You told me there is a husband on Vosnesensky Bridge. Of course, of course, I am talking too freely, but there are other ties, and you know, young man, a certain lightness of character that is, yes, yes, to be sure, to be sure, that is, I am not her husband at all. Oh, no doubt, but I tell you frankly that in reassuring you now, I want to set my own mind at rest, and that is why I am candid with you. You are upsetting me and in my way. I promise that I will call you, but I most humbly beg you to move further away and let me alone. I am waiting for someone too. Certainly, certainly, I will move further off. I respect the passionate impatience of your heart. (gasps) Oh! how well i understand you at this moment oh all right all right till we meet again but excuse me young man here i am again i don't know how to say give me your word of honour once more as a gentleman that you are not her lover oh mercy on us one more question the last do you know the surname of the husband of your that is i mean the lady who is the object of your devotion of course i do it is not your name and that is all about it why how do you know my name but i say you had better go you are losing time she might go away a thousand times why what do you want your ladies in a fox cape and a hood while mine is wearing a plaid cloak and a pale blue velvet hat what more do you want what else a pale blue velvet hat she has a plaid cloak and a pale blue velvet hat cried the pertinacious man instantly turning back again oh hang it all why that may well be and indeed my lady does not come here where is she then your lady you want to know that what is it to you i must own i am still ah mercy on us why you have no sense of decency none at all well my lady has friends here on the third story looking into the street why do you want me to tell you their names my goodness i have friends too who live on the third story and their windows look on to the street general general a general if you like i will tell you what general well then general polovitsin you don't say so no that is not the same damnation oh damnation not the same no not the same both were silent looking at each other in perplexity why are you looking at me like that exclaimed the young man shaking off his stupefaction and air of uncertainty with vexation the gentleman was in a fluster i must own come allow me allow me let us talk more sensibly now it concerns us both explain to me whom do you know there you mean who are my friends yes your friends well you see you see i see from your eyes i have guessed right hang it all no no hang it all are you blind why i am standing here before you i am not with her oh well i don't care whether you say so or not twice in his fury the young man turned on his heel with a contemptuous wave of his hand oh 
I meant nothing, I assure you. As an honourable man I will tell you all about it. At first my wife used to come here alone; they are relatives of hers. I had no suspicions. Yesterday I met his Excellency; he told me that he had moved three weeks ago from here to another flat, and my wife...." "That is not mine, but somebody else's, the husband's on Voznesensky Bridge." "That lady had told me that she was with them the day before yesterday in this flat, I mean, and the cook told me that his Excellency's flat had been taken by a young man called Bobinitsyn." "Oh, damn it all, damn it all! My dear sir, I am in terror, I am in alarm. Oh, hang it all, what is it to me that you are in terror and in alarm? Ah, over there, someone flitted by, over there. Where? Where? You just shout, Ivan Andreyitch, and I will run. All right, all right, oh, confound it. Ivan Andreyitch, here I am, cried Ivan Andreyitch returning utterly breathless what is it what is it where oh no i didn't mean anything i wanted to know what this lady's name is gla glafira no not glafira excuse me i cannot tell you her name as he said this the worthy man was as white as a sheet oh of course it's not glafira i know it is not glafira and mine's not glafira but with whom can she be where there oh damn it damn it the young man was in such a fury that he could not stand still there you see how did you know that her name was glafira oh damn it all really to have a bother with you too why you say that yours is not called glafira my dear sir what a way to speak no oh, the devil as though that mattered now what is she your wife no that is i am not married but i would not keep flinging the devil at a respectable man in trouble a man i will not say worthy of esteem but at any rate a man of education you keep saying the devil the devil to be sure the devil take it so there you are do you understand you are blinded by anger and i say nothing oh dear who is that where there was a noise and a sound of laughter two pretty girls ran down the steps both the men rushed up to them oh what manners what do you want where are you shoving they are not the right ones ah so you have pitched on the wrong ones cab where do you want to go mademoiselle to pokrov get in Anushka. i'll take you oh i'll sit on the other side off now mind you drive quickly the cab drove off where did they come from oh dear oh dear hadn't we better go there where why to bobinitsyn's no that's out of the question why i would go there of course but then she would tell me some other story she would get out of it she would say that she had come on purpose to catch me with someone and i should get into trouble and you know she may be there but you i don't know for what reason why you might go to the general's but you know he has moved that doesn't matter you know she has gone there so you go too don't you understand behave as though you didn't know the general had gone away go as though you had come to fetch your wife and so on and then well and then find the person you want at bobinitsyn's <laughs> damnation take you what a senseless well and what is it to you my findings you see you see what what my good man what you are on the same old tack again oh lord have mercy on us you ought to be ashamed you absurd person you senseless person yes but why are you so interested do you want to find out find out what what oh damnation take you i have no thoughts for you now 
I'll go alone. Go away. Get along. Look out. Be off. My dear sir, you are almost forgetting yourself, cried the gentleman in raccoon in despair. Well, what of it? What if I am forgetting myself? said the young man, setting his teeth and stepping up to the gentleman in raccoon in a fury. What of it? Forgetting myself before whom? He thundered, clenching his fists. But allow me, sir. Well, who are you? Before whom am I forgetting myself? What is your name? I don't know about that, young man. Why do you want my name? I cannot tell it to you. I better come with you let us go i won't hang back i am ready for anything but i assure you i deserve greater politeness and respect you ought never to lose your self-possession and if you are upset about something i can guess about what at any rate there is no need to forget yourself you are still a very very young man what is it to me that you are old there's nothing wonderful in that go away why are you dancing about here how am i old of course in position but i'm not dancing about i can see that but get away with you no i'll stay with you you cannot forbid me i am mixed up in it too i will come with you well then keep quiet keep quiet hold your tongue they both went up the steps and ascended the stairs to the third story it was rather dark stay have you got matches matches what matches do you smoke cigars oh yes i have i have here they are here they are here stay the gentleman in raccoon rummaged in a fluster <sharp inhale> what a senseless definition i believe this is the door this 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 why are you bawling hush my dear sir overcoming my feelings i you are a reckless fellow so there the light flared up yes so it is here is the brass plate this is bobinitsin's do you see bobinitsin i see it i see it hush why has it gone out yes it has should we not yes we must responded the gentleman in raccoon knock then no why should i you begin you knock coward you are a coward yourself get away with you i almost regret having confided my secret to you you i what about me you take advantage of my distress you see that i am upset but do i care i think it's ridiculous that's all about it why are you here why are you here too delightful morality observed the gentleman in raccoon with indignation what are you saying about morality what are you well it's immoral what why to your thinking every deceit husband is a noodle what are you the husband i thought the husband was on vostosensky bridge so what is it to you why do you meddle i do believe that you are the lover listen if you go on like this i shall be forced to think that you are a noodle that is do you know who that is you mean to say that i am the husband said the gentleman in raccoon stepping back as though he were scald with boiling water hush hold your tongue do you hear it is she no Whew. how dark it is there was a hush a sound was audible in bobinski's flat why should we quarrel sir whispered the gentleman in raccoon but you took offence yourself damn it all but you drove me out of all patience hold your tongue you must admit that you are a very young man hold your tongue of course i share your idea that a husband in such a position is a noodle 
Oh, will you hold your tongue? Oh, but why such savage persecution of the unfortunate husband? It is she. But at that moment the sound ceased. Is it she? It is. It is. It is. But why are you... You worrying about it. It is not your trouble. My dear sir, my dear sir, muttered the gentleman in raccoon, turning pale and gulping. I am, of course, greatly agitated. You can see for yourself my abject position. But now it's night, of course, but tomorrow, though indeed we are not likely to meet tomorrow, though I am not afraid of meeting you, and besides, it is not I. It is my friend on Vosnesensky Bridge. It really is he. It is his wife. It is somebody else's wife. Poor fellow, I assure you, I know him very intimately. If you will allow me, I will tell you all about it. I am a great friend of his, as you can see for yourself, or I shouldn't be in such a state about him now, as you see for yourself. Several times I said to him, Why are you getting married, dear boy? You have position you have means you are highly respected why risk it all at the caprice of coquetry you must see that no i am going to be married he said domestic bliss here's domestic bliss for you in old days he deceived other husbands now he is drinking the cup you must excuse me but this explanation was absolutely necessary he is an unfortunate man and is drinking the cup now <gasps> at this point the gentleman in raccoon gave such a gulp that he seemed to be sobbing in earnest oh damnation take them all there are plenty of fools but who are you the young man ground his teeth in anger what you must admit after this that i have been gentlemanly and open with you and you take such a tone no excuse me what is your name why do you want to know my name no i cannot tell you my name do you know chevrin the young man said quickly chevrin yes chevrin Ah. saying this the gentleman in the wadded overcoat mimicked the gentleman in raccoon do you understand no what chabrin answered the gentleman in raccoon in a fluster he's not chabrin he's a very respectable man i can excuse your discourtesy due to the tortures of jealousy he's a scoundrel a mercenary soul a rogue that takes bribes he steals government money he'll be had up for it before long excuse me said the gentleman in raccoon turning pale you don't know him i see you don't know him at all no i don't know him personally but i know him from others who are in close touch with him from what others sir i am agitated as you see a fool a jealous idiot he doesn't look after his wife that's what he is if you like to know excuse me young man you are grievously mistaken oh oh a sound was heard in bobinitsyn's flat a door was opened voices were heard oh that's not she i recognize her voice i understand it all now this is not she said the gentleman in raccoon turning as white as a sheet hush the young man leaned against the wall my dear sir i am off it is not she i am glad to say all right be off then why are you staying then what's it to you the door opened and the gentleman in raccoon could not refrain from dashing headlong downstairs a man and a woman walked by the young man and his heart stood still he heard a familiar feminine voice and then a husky male voice utterly unfamiliar never mind i will order the sledge said the husky voice oh yes yes very well do it will be here directly 
The lady was left alone. Glafira, where are your vows? cried the young man in the wadded overcoat, clutching the lady's arm. Oh, who is it? It's you, Taborogov. My goodness, what are you doing here? Who is it you have been with here? What? My husband. Go away, go away. He'll be coming out directly from in there, from the Polovitsyns. Go away. For goodness sake, go away. It's three weeks since the Polovitsyns moved. I know all about it. I. The lady dashed downstairs. The young man overtook her. Who told you? asked the lady your husband madame ivan andreitch he is here before you madame ivan andreitch was indeed standing at the front door ay it's you cried the gentleman in raccoon ay c'est vous cried glafira petrovna rushing up to him with unfeigned delight oh dear you can't think what has been happening to me i went to see the polovitsyns only fancy you know that they are living now by ismailovsky bridge i told you do you remember i took a sledge from there the horses took fright and bolted they broke the sledge and, and i was thrown out about a hundred yards from here the coachman was taken up i was in despair fortunately monsieur tvorogov what monsieur tvorogov was more like a fossil than like monsieur tvorogov monsieur tvorogov saw me here and undertook to escort me but now you are here and i can only express my warm gratitude to you ivan ilyitch the lady gave her hand to the stupefied ivan ilyitch and almost pinched instead of pressing it monsieur tvorogov an acquaintance of mine it was at the Skorlopov's ball we had the pleasure of meeting. I believe I told you, don't you remember, Coco? Oh, of course, of course, I, I remember, said the gentleman in raccoon, addressed as Coco. Delighted, delighted. And he warmly pressed the hand of Monsieur Tvoroga. Who is it? What does it mean? I am waiting, said a husky voice before the group stood a gentleman of extraordinary height he took out a lorgnette and looked intently at the gentleman in the raccoon coat da ah, monsieur bobinitsin twittered the lady where have you come from what a meeting only fancy i have just had it upset in a sledge but here is my husband jean monsieur bobinitsin at the karpov's ball ah uh, delighted very much delighted but i'll take a carriage at once my dear yes do john do i still feel frightened i am all of a tremble i feel quite giddy at the masquerade tonight she whispered to dvorogov good-bye good-bye mr bobinitsin we shall meet to-morrow at the karpov's ball most likely no excuse me i shall not be there to-morrow i don't know about to-morrow if it is like this now mr bobinitsin muttered something between his teeth made a scrape with his boot got into his sledge and drove away a carriage drove up the lady got into it the gentleman in the raccoon coat stopped seemed incapable of making a movement and gazed blankly at the gentleman in the wadded coat the gentleman in the wadded coat smiled rather foolishly i don't know excuse me delighted to make your acquaintance answered the young man bowing with curiosity and a little intimidated delighted delighted i think you have lost your galosh oh i oh yes thank you thank you i keep meaning to get rubber ones the foot gets so hot in rubbers said the young man apparently with immense interest jean are you coming it does make it hot coming directly darling we are having an interesting conversation precisely so as you say it does make the foot hot but excuse me i oh certainly delighted very much delighted to make your acquaintance the gentleman in raccoon got into the carriage the carriage set off the young man remained standing looking after it in astonishment 
II The following evening there was a performance of some sort at the Italian Opera. Ivan Andreyitch burst into the theatre like a bomb. Such furor, such a passion for music had never been observed in him before. It was known for a positive fact, anyway, that Ivan Andreyitch used to be exceeding fond of a nap for an hour or two at the Italian Opera. He even declared on several occasions how sweet and pleasant it was. Why, the prima donna, he used to say to his friends, muse a lullaby to you like a little white kitten. But it was a long time ago, last season, that he used to say this. Now, alas, even at home, Ivan Andreyitch did not sleep at nights. Nevertheless, he burst into the crowded opera house like a bomb. Even the conductor started suspiciously at the sight of him and glanced out of the corner of his eye at his side pocket in the full expectation of seeing the hilt of a dagger hidden there in readiness. It must be observed that there were at that time two parties, each supporting the superior claims of its favorite prima donna. They were called the blah blah, sis, and the blah blah, nis both parties were so devoted to music that the conductors actually began to be apprehensive of some startling manifestation of the passion for the good and the beautiful embodied in the two prima donnas this was how it was that looking at the youthful dash into the parterre of a grey-haired senior though indeed he was not actually grey-haired but a man about fifty rather bald and altogether of respectable appearance the conductor could not help recalling the lofty judgment of hamlet prince of denmark upon the evil example set by age to youth and as we have mentioned above looking out of the corner of his eye at the gentleman's side pocket in the expectation of seeing a dagger but there was a pocket-book and nothing else there darting into the theatre ivan andreyitch instantly scanned all the boxes of the second tier and oh horror his heart stood still she was here she was sitting in the box general polovitsin with his wife and sister-in-law was there too the general's adjutant an extremely alert young man was there too there was a civilian too ivan andreyitch strained his attention and his eyesight <gasps> but oh horror the civilian treacherously concealed himself behind the adjutant and remained in the darkness of obscurity she was here and yet she had said she would not be here it was this duplicity for some time displayed in every step glafira petrovna took which crushed ivan andreyitch this civilian youth reduced him at last to utter despair he sank down in his stall utterly overwhelmed why one may ask it was a very simple matter it must be observed that ivan andreyitch's stall was close to the bag noir and to make matters worse the treacherous box in the second tier was exactly above his stall so that to his intense annoyance he was utterly unable to see what was going on over his head at which he raged and got as hot as a samovar the whole of the first act passed unnoticed by him that is he did not hear a single note of it it is maintained that what is good in music is that musical impressions can be made to fit any mood the man who rejoices finds joy in its strains while he who grieves finds sorrow in it a regular tempest was howling in ivan andreyitch's ears to add to his vexation such terrible voices were shouting behind him before him and on both sides of him that ivan andreyitch's heart was torn at last the act was over but at the instant when the curtain was falling our hero had an adventure such as no pen can describe it sometimes happens that a playbill flies down from the upper boxes when the play is dull and the audience is yawning this is quite an event for them they watch with particular interest the flight of the extremely soft paper from the upper gallery and take pleasure in watching its zigzagging journey down to the very stalls where it infallibly settles on some head which is quite unprepared to receive it it is certainly very interesting to watch the embarrassment of the head 
for the head is invariably embarrassed i am indeed always in terror over the ladies opera glasses which usually lie on the edge of the boxes i am constantly fancying that they will fly down on some unsuspecting head but i perceive that this tragic observation is out of place here and so i shall send it to the columns of those newspapers which are filled with advice warnings against swindling tricks against unconscientiousness hints for getting rid of beetles if you have them in the house recommendations of the celebrated mr principi sworn foe of all beetles in the world not only russian but even foreign such as prussian cockroaches and so on but ivan andreitch had an adventure which has never hitherto been described there flew down on his as already stated somewhat bald head not a playbill i confess i am actually ashamed to say what did fly down upon his head because i am really loath to remark that on the respectable and bare that is partly hairless head of the jealous and irritated ivan andreitch there settled such an immoral object as a scented love letter poor ivan andreitch utterly unprepared for this unforeseen and hideous occurrence started as though he had caught upon his head a mouse or some other wild beast that the note was a love letter of that there could be no mistake it was written on scented paper just as love letters are written in novels and folded up so to be treacherously small so that it might be slipped into a lady's glove it had probably fallen by accident at the moment it had been handed to her the playbill might have been asked for for instance and the note deftly folded in the playbill was being put into her hands but an instant perhaps an accidental nudge from the adjutant extremely adroit in his apologies for his awkwardness and the note had slipped from a little hand that trembled with confusion and the civilian youth stretching out his impatient hand received instead of the note the empty playbill and did not know what to do with it a strange and unpleasant incident for him no doubt but you must admit that for ivan andreitch it was still more unpleasant predestine he murmured breaking into a cold sweat and squeezing the note in his hand predestine the bullet finds the guilty man the thought flashed through his mind no that's not right in what way am i guilty but there is another proverb once out of luck never out of trouble but it was not enough that there was a ringing in his ears and a dizziness in his head at this sudden incident ivan andreitch sat petrified in his chair as the saying is more dead than alive he was persuaded that his adventure had been observed on all sides although at that moment the whole theatre began to be filled with uproar and calls of encore he sat overwhelmed with confusion flushing crimson and not daring to raise his eyes as though some unpleasant surprise something out of keeping with a brilliant assembly had happened to him at last he ventured to lift his eyes charmingly sung he observed to a dandy sitting on his left side the dandy who was in the last stage of enthusiasm clapping his hands and still more actively stamping with his feet gave ivan andreitch a cursory and absent-minded glance and immediately putting up his hands like a trumpet to his mouth so as to be more audible shouted the prima donna's name ivan andreitch who had never heard such a roar was delighted he has noticed nothing he thought and turned around but the stout gentleman who was sitting behind him had turned around too and with his back to him was scrutinizing the boxes through his opera glass b is all right too thought ivan andreitch in front of course nothing had been seen timidly and with a joyous hope in his heart he stole a glance at the bag noir near which was his stall and started with the most unpleasant sensation a lovely lady was sitting there who holding her handkerchief to her mouth and leaning back in her chair was laughing as though in hysterics ugh these women murmured ivan andreitch and treading on people's feet he made for the exit now i ask my readers to decide i beg them to judge between me 
and Ivan Andreyitch. Was he right at that moment? The Grand Theatre, as we all know, contains four tiers of boxes and a fifth row above the gallery. Why must he assume that the note had fallen from one particular box, from that very box and no other? Why not, for instance, from the gallery where there are often ladies too? But passion is an exception to every rule, and jealousy is the most exceptional of all passions. Ivan Andreyitch rushed into the foyer, stood by the lamp, broke the seal, and read. Today, immediately after performance, in G Street, at the corner of X, Lane K Buildings, on the third floor, the first on the right from the stairs, the front entrance, be there, Sofo. For God's sake, Ivan Andreyitch did not know the handwriting, but he had no doubt it was an assignation. To track it out, to catch it, and nip the mischief in the bud was Ivan Andreyitch's first idea. The thought occurred to him to unmask the infamy at once on the spot, but how could it be done? Ivan Andreyitch even ran up to the second row of boxes, but judiciously came back again. He was utterly unable to decide where to run. Having nothing clear he could do, he ran round to the other side and looked through the open door of somebody else's box at the opposite side of the theatre. Yes, it was so. It was. Young ladies and young men were sitting in all the seats vertically, one above another, in all the five tiers. The note might have fallen from all tiers at once, for Ivan Andreyitch suspected all of them of being in a plot against him but nothing made him any better no probabilities of any sort the whole of the second act he was running up and down all the corridors and could find no peace of mind anywhere he would have dashed into the box office in hope of finding from the attendant there the names of the persons who had taken boxes on all the four tiers but the box office was shut at last there came an outburst of furious shouting and applause the performance was over calls for the singers began and two voices from the top gallery were particularly deafening the leaders of the opposing factions but they were not what mattered to ivan andreyitch already thoughts of what he was to do next flitted through his mind he put on his overcoat and rushed off to g street to surprise them there to catch them unawares, to unmask them, and in general, to behave somewhat more energetically than he had done the day before. He soon found the house, and was just going in at the front door, when the figure of a dandy in an overcoat darted forward right in front of him, passed him, and went up the stairs to the third story it seemed to ivan andreyitch that this was the same dandy though he had not been able at the time to distinguish his features in the theatre his heart stood still the dandy was two flights of stairs ahead of him at last he heard a door open on the third floor and open without the ringing of a bell as though the visitor was expected the young man disappeared into the flat ivan andreyitch mounted to the third floor before there was time to shut the door he meant to stand at the door to reflect prudently on his next step to be rather cautious and then to determine upon some decisive course of action but at that very minute a carriage rumbled to the entrance the doors were flung open noisily and heavy footsteps began ascending to the third story to the sound of coughing and clearing of the throat ivan andreyitch could not stand his ground and walked into the flat with all the majesty of an injured husband a servant maid rushed to meet him much agitated then a man-servant appeared but to stop ivan andreyitch was impossible he flew in like a bomb and crossing two dark rooms suddenly found himself in a bedroom facing a lovely young lady who was trembling all over with alarm and gazing at him in utter horror as though she could not understand what was happening around her at that instant there was a sound in the adjoining room of heavy footsteps coming straight towards the bedroom they were the same footsteps that had been mounting the stairs goodness it is my husband cried the lady clasping her hands and turning whiter than her dressing-gown End of chapter 7